So, you want to pursue a career as a dancer, but don't quite know where to start? Well, today's show is for you. Today's guest, Kenan Cooks, is a professional dancer, choreographer, and international instructor. He's here to talk about finding balance, pushing limits, and what you need to know about succeeding in the commercial dance industry. Welcome back to the Creators Club, where we find out what drives artists and creative professionals just like you. I am joined today with a very special guest, dancer, international choreographer, celebrity choreographer, Keenan Cooks. How are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? Um, let's just jump right into it. So first of all, for the people viewing that may not know who you are, I just wanna talk a little bit about your story and what kind of brought you to where you are today. Mm -hmm. um, well, I feel like my story is a little different from everyone else's. Uh, I didn't like start dancing at a young, young age. Um, mm -hmm. I started dancing when I was a teenager, but even before that, um, I had a brain tumor when I was eight, so I was told that I was never going to be able to dance again. Mm -hmm. And I think from that moment of hearing the word never, it kind of just drove me to like go balls to the wall. Mm -hmm. So um, from there, I went to perform at Arts High School in Boston, Boston Arts Academy, and that's where I started like my formal training. Like I thought that I would be going there doing hip hop and all this stuff, but like I was in tights, like, <laughs> ballet, modern, tap, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. I got those like fundamentals to kind of help carve me as a dancer period oh, wow. um from there joined nia dance troupe mm -hmm. um and that's kind of where i got my discipline um when i was 18 i moved to new york to go to college i went to marymount manhattan college and that's kind of where i kind of found the commercial world okay i figured out what the commercial world even was because mm -hmm. i think us coming from boston boston's where i'm from as well um we didn't really have any expectations or really know what the industry was. So once I moved, it was like a whole different ball game. Yeah. I wasn't the best. I still had a lot that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of figured out my style, figured out what I liked, my niche and all those things. So yeah, and I kind of started to train under Luam a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's also a choreographer in New York City. And then in 2011, I did Motivate Excellence, which is a uh, commercial training dance program okay. led by Rhapsody James, another choreographer who um, I trained under. And then from there, I kind of like finally figured out like who I was, yeah. like what I wanted to do. I was okay with who I was in terms of like height, body build, color, all of that. Um, so that was a great program for me. And from like 2013 till now, kind of like my world is just kind of like just yeah. been crazy. Cool. So we're getting to that, but I just want to go back real quick. So mm -hmm. you mentioned um, after training in Boston for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, what sparked you to want to go to New York City? Mm -hmm. And then once you got to New York City, what did you find was the most challenging with getting into that industry, the dance industry within New York City? Um, my mother always tells me before I was even like... Before I even knew what dance was, I wanted to move to New York City. Really? I don't even know like where that came from, but I was just one of those kids. So that was always a goal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to get into, what was going to happen, but New York was always the goal. Mm -hmm. I got a full scholarship to a college in Boston mm -hmm. just to start a dance team because they knew I danced and I still wanted to go to New York. Wow. Um, so that was just a thing that was always going to happen. For some reason, it was just in me. Yeah. Um, once I got there, I just kind of realized that I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Uh -huh. Boston's a small city in terms of the dance community, mm -hmm. arts community, period. So I was kind of one of the better ones. Yeah. And you kind of like take that with you where you go. Like, yep. oh, this is not going to be that hard. Yeah, people yeah. are going to see me. They're going to know what's up. No. There are people <laughs> who have been doing this yeah. for years. So now I get there and I'm starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And at first that was really hard for me. Yeah. Because I already had this clout and I already had these people who already thought that I was great. So it took adjusting. So for me, the biggest thing was adjusting. <laughs> And starting over mm -hmm. and realizing that the stuff that I thought I knew, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And being okay and being open to that. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to letting it defeat me, let it drive me. Like when you see those amazing dances and you see these people teaching these classes, using that to drive you. Like mm -hmm. that's where I want to be. Okay. Or I want to be above that. Yeah. So it was the adjusting that was hard for me, but it also helped push me to go right. harder. So like you said, sometimes when you come from a smaller community where you may have be leaving, you may be leaving as like the top dog. Mm -hmm. When you get to a situation or a new city like uh, New York or Los Angeles, and um, you start realizing all the different components to the industry, whether it be being a better dancer or a better performer, whether it be working on your look, whether it be um, increasing your network because you got to know people. Mm -hmm. With all those different things, what did you decide was the first thing that you wanted to to work on? Um, for me, the first thing was dance, the mm -hmm. dance. If I knew what I knew back 
what I, if I knew what I knew now, mm-hmm. back then, that probably wouldn't have been the first thing. Okay. Because what I've realized now as a choreographer and still as a dancer, that the dance is the last component. Mm-hmm. But for me, the first thing was the dance. Mm-hmm. I realized right away, I'm a very straightforward person. I'm very smart in the sense of like noticing things. I realized that I wasn't on the same level as the people who were great. Okay. So I needed to get my dance together first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the reason why I actually that because I feel like a lot of the times people put so much emphasis on talent and they think that's the mm-hmm. most important thing exactly. in the industry. Right. And in my opinion, like talent is a given. Mm-hmm. Like no one's here to teach you how to be talented. Right. At the very least, be talented. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's all the other S H I T that people mm-hmm. don't focus on, like networking, mm-hmm. like your image. And just the, the constant everyday hustle yeah. that people kind of brush under the rug and they just train and train and train and train. But then you realize, especially when you get to a new city like New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta is a big uh, market for dance now, well, as well, mm-hmm. um, that everyone can dance. Exactly. It's those little other things that are going to set, set, set you apart. So you were like, all right, I want to be a better dancer. I want to be in that same mm-hmm. level. Great. So what kind of steps did you take to become a better dancer? Um, well, I was like dead broke. Like... Mm-hmm. Broke. I didn't have any money, so uh, when I first moved to New York, the moments that I could save money, I would go and take class. Okay. Like that's what I would do. And for me, it wasn't enough to just take class. Like I was watching. Like I was looking at who the teacher was looking at. I was looking at who people were looking at. Yeah. That's who I need to be next to. Mm-hmm. That's who I need to emulate. If I can't be in class every day, if I'm only in class once a week or once a month, I need to make it worth make it. it count. I need yeah. to make it count. I need to make it count. So that's what I did. Um, I took. At first, I was taking one teacher because that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. That's all I knew. But once I started to get in the community more, I started to take different teachers. I went from taking Luan to taking Cheryl Marikami. From there, I met Neil. So I was able to start t- taking different teachers. And because I was, I feel I was so smart when I was taking class, that started to get noticed. Okay. Still not realizing that the dance wasn't the most important right. part. Right. Mm-hmm. That's all that was in my head is I need to smash this. I need to be in these classes. They need to notice me. I need to show them that I can dance. Mm-hmm. I could dance. Okay. That was a given. It was really everything else. Okay. Like you said that I needed to work on, but again, I didn't realize that until literally like two years later. Wow. So you went in, you did all this training, you learned from all these people. So now Keenan's a better dancer, mm-hmm. right? Where did that leave you? Where were you at at that point? Um, at that point, I still had no agent. <laughs> I still didn't know what my next step was. I didn't know what to do. And honestly, when I first moved to New York, maybe two years after that, I booked this job, like this really big job with a lot of the dancers. And I think that was the moment where I realized I wasn't that good. Uh, okay. I, I needed more work. Yeah. But even still after that, I didn't know that I could have went to an agency and got an agent from doing a big mm-hmm. job like that. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't know these things because all I was doing was coming to dance mm-hmm. and leaving. Okay, so let's talk about agencies then. Mm-hmm. So um, first of all, what are the agencies that we know of, right? Mm-hmm. In New York, the, mo- the the I won't say the most popular, but the ones that everybody goes for that are in demand are Claire Talent Group, which is who you started with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Block Talent Agency. Mm-hmm. There's MSA Agency. Yeah. I think that about covers it for New York. No, now there's a new one. There's CSD as well. Right? Mm-hmm. And then there's one more, um, Lucille. Yeah. Lucille yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then in LA, other than what we just named, what else is there? Uh, there's GTA uh-huh. and there's MTA. So uh, Go To Talent and Movement Talent mm-hmm. Agency. So in your opinion, well, first of all, what was um, your process in getting an agent? Um... So once I finally realized what an agent was, like that was my next goal. Well, there you go. What is an agent? Um, so in your ba- words, I mean, for me, basically, an agent is like the middle man to the jobs. Mm-hmm. So there are opportunities that we as dancers by ourselves can't get because you have these record labels and these choreographers who go to the agency. So the agency basically just represents you mm-hmm. and sells you mm-hmm. or sells their dancers to the artist, to the brand, to whatever the product is or whatever the job is at that moment. So um, it's really, again, now, knowing what I know now, you don't need an agent, Mm -hmm. but it is important to have one, especially when you're starting out. Right. Um, So my process was, again, moving to New York. I didn't didn't know anything about that. So once I finally did learn about agencies, um, I just went to auditions. Like I just went to all the auditions. I auditioned for all the agencies, not... Do, really doing research to see which one would fit me best mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. they already have I was waiting for that if they have <laughs> yeah. so many black guys already at the time I had braids was that even a good idea so I was just auditioning and nothing was happening mm-hmm. 
um, as I started to get better, as we talked about, I would make it further in these auditions, right. but still wouldn't get signed. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand why. Um, so finally, I kind of just sat back for a second. I was like, this is not going to be my main focus because it's kind of driving me crazy. Because at one point, I like uh, finished uh, the program, Motivating Excellence, that I told you about. And uh, one of the um, help, uh, teachers in the program actually referred me to an agency. Gotcha. I won't say which one. Mm-hmm. But referred me to an agency. The agency I wanted to be with so bad. Mm-hmm. And I met with the agent. She was terrible. Mm-hmm. Like a really mean, terrible person. One, I had no business being in that meeting because I didn't know what I wanted yet. Okay. But she was very, very mean. So I kind of just took it upon myself to back away from that situation. And I just was like, when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Right. When I'm ready, it's going to happen. So um, in 2013, at this point, I had been in New York for like five, six years, still no agent. In 2013, I auditioned for Clear Talent. And I kind of just went in like, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. I know what I bring to the table, but I'm going to dance for my life. And that was the moment that I got signed mm. when I didn't put so much pressure on it and I was just myself. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah. you know, <clears throat> trying to be anybody else. So um, from there, I was with Claire from 2013 up until the end of last year. Um, I did some great things with Claire, but I felt like for what I wanted for the next phase of my career mm-hmm. at this moment, they couldn't do that for me. Mm-hmm. So um, in August, I switched to Block Agency, who I'm with now and... Yeah. Going with that. So I want to stay on this topic for a little bit. So as he mentioned before, an agent pretty much is a professional representative that interacts on a client's behalf, which is the dancers that are signed to the agency. Um, agents have to be underneath a talent agency, and they represent you as far as um, getting information for jobs and opportunities, as well as um, ne- reading and negotiating and interpreting your contracts for you. Um, and like he said, Especially today in age, today's day and age with social media and the fact that you do have platforms that are out there to uh, allow you to promote yourself, um, agents aren't as necessary if you are business savvy and know how to go out and find that information yourself and know how to close deals. However, for anyone out there that's just starting out, um, getting an agent is definitely the, the, the first thing that you should be looking into. Um, but something you touched on briefly was that you didn't do your research to kind of find out what is the right agency for me. Mm-hmm. And that is something that I see happen a lot yeah. in conversations I've had with a lot of people where they just want to be signed so bad that they go to any agency that will take them. And because um, they didn't do their research and, and, like you said, figure out, okay, how many people on this roster look like me? Mm-hmm. Does this agency have a lot of connections um, with jobs opportunities that I actually want? want. Yep. Um, do they work with choreographers that I want to work with? And they get on these rosters and they're just stuck on these rosters not getting sent out to auditions, not really working jobs, a year goes by, two years goes by, and they're like, I don't understand what's going on, they want to change agencies, and they're all upset, and they've wasted all this time Mm -hmm. because they didn't do their research to begin with. So I guess the lesson in that situation is that before you go, definitely go to agency auditions to kind of get a feel of what they're like, Mm -hmm. but every agent, major agency has a website, go on there, see what they're about, see who the choreographers are, see who the other dancers are, and just kind of make sure that it's the right situation for you. Ask your friends that are signed what their experience is like, um, because that would help you make the best decision on what agency to choose. Now, that being said, you also reason. yeah. That Do being said, reason. you also want to remember that your situation, your um, experience in an agency would not be the same as the next person, even if you guys have the same agency and same agent. So again, it's just about going into these meetings, going into these auditions, knowing what you want as a professional, and that will help you um, make that decision. Absolutely. Cool. So we're a trained dancer now. Mm-hmm. We found an agent. Mm-hmm. What was next? So now you're signed. Now, did your career just take off and all of a sudden you were booked left and right because you had an agent? Like, what happened? Okay, so here's, <laughs> here's the real thing. Once you get signed, it's worse. Yeah. Because now there's pressure. Mm-hmm. Like, people... I just never understand, like, dancers sometimes because people now get signed and it's like, I'm good. Like, yeah. it, it's worse because now there's a pressure for you to book, for you to have everything right. For you to get it together. Mm-hmm. So for me, that was the first thing. I was like, all right, this hair looks a little crazy. Let's fix it. Mm-hmm. Let's get this look together. Let's figure out what your thing is. Like, for me, a long time, I was obsessed with height. Mm. Height, height, me too. height, height. So I was like, you know what? I need to be taller. Like, I can dance already. You know, I got style. Like, I'm getting my look together. Now I need to be taller. I need to be taller. So... <laughs> that was my obsession for the first like year. Mm-hmm. So I like got heel inserts. I was wearing sneakers that were higher. 
And it was like super stressful because I was at auditions, like busting my ass, falling because my shoe, my foot was coming out of the shoe. Mm-hmm. But um, I just think the next thing for me was figuring out my niche. Like, what can I do really well? Mm-hmm. What can I do? So I know I'm not comparing myself to this person and I can push for these things. Right. So I got signed in April. I didn't book a job until like September, mm-hmm. which doesn't even sound bad, but in your head, you're like, oh my God, they're going to drop me. Yeah, I yeah. don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, from that moment, for me, it was really about like just getting it together in terms of like me and this, in terms of my look, my body, and my mental, and really like now really making those connections. Mm-hmm. So I'm not just waiting on an agent to send me out, but now so-and-so knows me. I'm right. going to go to LA. There you go. I can meet this person, that person. They know that I'm good at this. Mm-hmm. I'm putting this out there. I'm putting that out there. So for me, it was about getting this together and now making the relationship so I'm not just depending on right. clear to get me everything. Yes. Um, and I want to touch on that because that's actually a really great point. I think a common misconception when people get agencies is that, okay, now I can sit back, I can True. chill, mm-hmm. they're going to handle it. But that is completely false. Even if you have an agent, again, an agent will just get you the information. It's still up to you to seal the deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, sealing the deal means you need to know people, you need to know who you are, you need to look your best, mm-hmm. you need to always perform your best. Those are all things that contribute to you being able to get a job. Right. All the agent's job is, is to get you the information. Mm-hmm. That is it. They can sell you, they can pitch you. Sometimes it's great because they can get you into smaller calls yep. or um, you know, direct bookings, but it's your job to seal the deal. And um, I think also, too, where the miseducation uh, is, is understanding the difference between an agent and a manager. Yes. So a manager is the one that's going to work to develop you as a talent. They're going to the ones that are going to tell you, oh, you should get these kind of headshots, and here's who you should get them by, and mm-hmm. you should do this kind of training um, and get these kind of skills in order to get into acting. Or they're the ones that are going to be there to hold your hand. Yes. You know what I mean? And and, and managers also can show you more attention because usually they have a smaller client list. Yep. Agents are dealing with 100 to 200 individual clients. They cannot hold your hand and drive you through the process. Right. It's up to you to be more self-efficient and proactive to figure out those things on your own. So I think, you, uh, I think that was a great point to touch on. And it's better to know that like right away yeah. because I feel like a lot of people start to take things personal yeah. where they see their friends going into an audition and like well why didn't I get sent on that well also your friend is 6 foot and right. you're 5 two. Right. so it's better to just know mm-hmm. something like that now like your agent is not like your best friend Right. so they're not like make sure that Keenan gets it like mm-hmm. they're doing what's best for their company at the right. moment so what you need to do is what's best for you mm-hmm. at the moment as well yeah and um, like he mentioned as well as an as a entertainer, we're all going to go through that phase of trying to change who we are mm-hmm. to fit the standard. And I believe in becoming the standard, at least for now. Yep. You know I me mean? In the sense of like, you know what? If I do got to put some heel inserts into my shoe to just be a little bit taller, do that. Mm-hmm. If I do have to consider a new haircut so that I can look a little more commercial, then do that. Yeah. I believe in becoming the standard, at least for now, until you've gotten the, the resume and the credits and the experience and the relationships to be 100% you. And people will respect you for what you do, and they're like, we take you as you are. Right. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with making little changes, but when it comes to the point where it's detrimental to your, your, your health, your mental health, health all around, mm-hmm. that's when it becomes a problem. But yeah. I totally, enc- <clears throat> I won't say encourage, but I totally believe in making little adjustments to fit, you know, the standard right. for now, and then you become, you know, who you are as you grow to, and get experience. Um, all right, cool. We're a trained dancer. Mm-hmm. We're making a list here, basically. <laughs> We're a trained dancer. That's the first step. Mm-hmm. We got an agent. Mm-hmm. We evaluated and kind of came in to be who we wanted to be as a performer and, and really identified who we are. Mm-hmm. Then what? Um, again, like I said to you, my journey is different from other people because dance is not something that I only wanted. Okay. Um, I also love and choreograph. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the steps to take for that journey. Okay. I knew I needed to have an agent, period, in life, and I knew that I wanted to dance. So the next thing for me, naturally, was to teach. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to teach at Broadway Dance Center, which is like the big dance studio in New York City. Mm -hmm. Um, So from doing Motivated Excellence with Rhapsody, we're kind of going back to go forward. (laughs) Um, From doing Motivated Excellence with Rhapsody, um, I, you know, was very... (coughs) smart about saying I want to dance but I also want to choreograph and I also want to teach yeah what became hard about that is so many people say you can't do all three yeah yeah and what I hated about that was again since I was little 
no one, you're not going to put like constraints on my dreams. Uh-huh. Since I was little, that's what I wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? So I was always like, that's cool, but this is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. So basically from constantly saying that, no matter what she said, um, she finally like asked me to sub her class at BDC. So I was able to start teaching. From there, not only was I able to start teaching, but it helped people know who I was more. Yeah. Yeah. Not even just dancers to come take my class, but now I'm this teacher at this big studio. So other teachers from other places are looking at me. Other uh, workshops are looking at me. Other companies are looking at me. So that's not only helping me Mm -hmm. as a teacher, but it's still helping me as a dancer too. Mm -hmm. Um, So after the whole evaluation step, the next step for me was naturally to get my teaching together. And I was able to start subbing at BDC and... Slowly but surely, my following started to pick up, and I think slowly but surely, I started to find myself as a teacher and as a choreographer. I didn't necessarily have a style. I, for about two or three years, I wasn't teaching. I was just dancing. Mm-hmm. So I was learning from other people. Yeah. So I'm taking from their style mm-hmm. and trying to do this, but I'm like, this is not me. So how can I carve out my lane, and how can I make my class different from this class? So that was like, shit, you know what? Can you a little ghetto? I was about to say, how would so, you define your style? So why don't we go with that? So for a while, like it was just like real full out, like real ratchet, real ghetto. And I'm not ashamed of that. I feel like a lot of people look at that and they're like, oh, that's too much. But that's who I was. That's where I came from. Mm-hmm. I was in dance groups where we were like wilding out. Mm-hmm. And now that I had the um, training to calm that down, mm-hmm. I could like morph that into something that was cool because nobody was really doing that. Okay. At the time when I came up, it was like very clean or like very groovy, but there was like no in between. Gotcha. So for me, that's how I was able to kind of come up because my style was so different from everyone else. And the more that I trained, the more that I knew, I'm like, this is a great style to have, but you still have to be able to do other things. Mm-hmm. So then every now and then I would throw something else different in there. So then my class kind of became the full out technical class. Yeah, it had this full out energy and this full out intention, but there was still like technique behind it. And it was still technical and it was still hard and it was still challenging. So mm-hmm. I guess it would be like ratchet technique. <laughs> yeah, like, so it was yeah. like a really like full out and like balls to the wall style, but there's still those technical aspects. There's still the musicality. There's still the textures. There's still the dynamics. Still the performance. Yeah. So once I did that, that's when my like following really like took off at yeah. BDC, and it was crazy to me because I just always remember being a student. So to be on the other side, not only did that help me as a teacher, but it helped me as a dancer because mm. I'm realizing what I like to see and what I don't like to see. So I'm like shit. That means that other choreographers and other teachers are doing the same thing. Yeah. So little did I know that my teaching was helping my dancing and my dancing was helping my teaching as well. Nice. So. Um, so you talked earlier about these boxes and people try to put you in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when it came to, as a dancer, especially when you were just starting out, it's like, no, you can't be a dancer and a choreographer and a teacher. Like, pick one. And you were like, nah, I'm going to do them all. And um, I think what's great about that is you have to be vocal about all the things that you love because that's the only way the opportunity is going to come your Absolutely. way. And again, that's something that I feel like can, can apply across all um, industries. Mm-hmm. Something I've learned myself where it's like you have to be able to sit at a table and be confident about things that you want to do, even if you're not great at them yet. Mm-hmm. Because because you had mentioned, I want to teach that opportunity came to you mm-hmm. because I knew, you know, a long time ago that I wanted to get into production. Those opportunities came, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was a good point to talk uh, talk about. But let's go into career. So as a dancer, as a teacher, as a choreographer, what were some of your um, favorite career moments? Um, for me, one of my favorite career moments to this day, I think it will still be my favorite, is um, in 2014, I toured with Prince Royce. He's like a huge Latin artist. He's like the equivalent of Justin Bieber in the Latin world. Um, It kind of just started, literally, I got direct booked. Um, I later found out, which I always tell people is really important, I later found out that um, the choreographer looked at my headshot, typed in my name on YouTube, and watched the first video that popped up. Mm. And that's how I got the job. Wow. So... We'll get back to that, but I always just tell people, make sure that everything online represents you amazingly. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was my favorite job. At first, it was supposed to just be a one and done. Mm-hmm. Like, we had this show in Puerto Rico, and that was supposed to be it. But it turned into nine months of us touring with him. Mm-hmm. So we went to Puerto Rico. We did a tour in Mexico. We went to Chile. We did the whole U.S. So that was amazing as a dancer for me. Um, then, like, my first uh, TV 
um, job was I did lip sync battles, season one of lip sync battles. So I got to work with John Legend. I got to work with Queen Latifah, Salt and Pepper, Taraji P Henson. That was great. Kind of coming full circle now because I'm back this year for mm-hmm. season five, yeah. which is amazing. Um, and then this past summer. I performed twice at the BT Awards uh, with Big Sean and Cardi, so that was just kind of like, when the hell does that ever happen? Yeah, yeah so that, that was, was awesome. super. That was super great um, for dancing. In terms of uh, choreography, uh, I choreographed a commercial for Gap. It was an online commercial. Mm, that was that. another amazing experience for me. At uh, first for me, so I was like super nervous about that. But that was great. I got to work with Martha Nichols, who's another dancer. She's awesome. Um, for about like a year and a half, I was choreographing for Cardi B, which was a great experience for me as well. Just um, kind of starting off with the artists and kind of going up with them and being in that situation. Um, last year, I was able to have my choreography on two major award yeah. shows. Which one? Uh, we did the post show for the BET Awards. Right, right. And then we did the VMAs. Yes. She did the pre show for the VMAs. That was all my choreography. <laughs> uh, so that was really cool just to kind of be in that situation, be in that type of control, be in those type of rooms with those type of people. Talking to those type of people was amazing for me. Um, teaching wise, uh, I've just been able to like travel so many places. So that's been great for me. Um, this year alone, I went to Israel. Um, I taught in China. I taught in Peru. And I taught in Spain. Um, I've also been to Germany teaching, taught in Paris, Japan, Korea. So I've been able to go a lot of places with something that people said you would never even make money right, from. Right, you know, yeah. something that I wasn't supposed to do. I wasn't supposed to do all three. Mm-hmm. And luckily, I've been successful because I put so much work into all three. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to do some great things. Yeah. I, damn. <laughs> right? So... <laughs> How do you find balance in all that? Like, how do you? Keep I don't. Saying? I don't. I don't. <laughs> okay, great. So let's talk about that. So that's not good. If you can't find balance. So what do you? What kind of action do you plan to take to to kind of find some balance with it all? With um, all this. To be completely honest, I now as a twenty seven year old man, adult, like I finally feel like I'm an adult. I understand why people say you can't do all three. Uh-huh. You can, and you have to just be so good at them all. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I was able to do from the people who I trained with. I was able to put my all into all three, but it becomes difficult because now I'm stepping into these rooms where people are looking at me as a choreographer but then I'm going to audition to be a dancer. Mm-hmm. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Can't, you can't look at me one way and then look at me another way, which I now understand. Uh-huh. Still not going to stop me. <laughs> but I just kind of have to go about things differently. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's difficult, I'm not going to lie, because there become situations where, like now, I'm on a job, a dance job, but I just got a super crazy teaching opportunity that I can't do Okay. because I'm on this job. Yeah. So for me, it's about taking the good with the bad and really understanding what opportunity is going to take me somewhere else. Yeah. So it's okay to miss this for now because yeah. it's going to come back around because I did this, mm-hmm. but it's hard. Yeah, I think it, I think it's both good and bad. I think mm-hmm. that it's bad in the sense that like trying to juggle all those things can be exhausting. Mm-hmm. And like you said, sometimes when you're on one thing, you're missing another opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's also the good part about exactly. it is having a versatile skill set that can constantly keep you working. When right. there's an off season in dance, you can teach and do choreography. When those are off seasons, you can dance. You know what I mean? So exactly. it's all working together. So there's definitely not anything wrong with that per se. But when it comes to your personal life, mm-hmm. and as you just mentioned, like being a 27 year old and just feeling the pressures of being of adulting, mm-hmm. yeah. what are things that you feel like you're sacrificing um, in your personal life, taking on all this that you kind of want to get to a point where you can? Whether it be travel more just for leisure and not for work, yeah. or spend more time with family, or just things like that, I just it's, it's crazy that you say that because I feel like up until 2017, I was sacrificing all those things. Mm-hmm. I wasn't spending a lot of time with my family, who I'm super close with. I wasn't really meeting new people. I wasn't really hanging out with friends unless we were in rehearsal or on a job. So I made it a super like important thing for 2017 to do more life stuff to do more like to create more memories because doing all those things kind of take away a lot of your time Mm -hmm. they've affected so many things they've affected relationships that i've been in Mm -hmm. they've affected friendships i've lost friends because of this work so Mm -hmm. for me 2017 was obviously the year of success i wanted to i had goals for the industry and i had like work goals but it was really important to me to have moments where i created memories i went on vacation with my Mm -hmm. family i went on vacation with my friends, I 
planned a whole week just to celebrate my birthday mm -hmm. and I missed out on things and I didn't care because I needed that for my sanity. Mm -hmm. I needed to look back and be like, yo, 2017 career-wise was amazing, but oh my God, I remember when I went to Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. I remember when we went to Las Vegas? Right, like, right, right. I still want to be a regular person. There you go. So it's really important to find that balance. Sometimes we get so used to chasing, chasing stuff. When you think about it, we're chasing other people's stuff because yeah. I don't own that mm -hmm. so I still need to have something for me right. I still need to have something that I was in control of so 2017 was really important for me to do that and sometimes I just said no to stuff so I could lay down and watch TV yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I just sometimes because I needed that there's too. a lot of power in saying no and it's yeah absolutely um I'm curious so what are some goals from last year that you say for yourself last year whether they be big or small mm -hmm. that you didn't quite accomplish that I did <laughs> oh, they're really stupid. I want to know. I wanted to learn how to drive this year. Okay. Last, last year, year. But I didn't do that because I was doing so much stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I feel like I 50, 50 did this. A big goal of mine last year was to meet different people other than dancers. Okay. Um, I have a friend, Tiffany McPherson. She's a DJ. Um, I'm sure she's done things with the Creators Club before. Mm -hmm. She always tells me, you can't always be in rooms with dancers. Because how will you get other opportunities? Mm -hmm. How will you meet new people? How will you be seen in different lights if you're only with dancers? So that was a big... Shout out to Tiffany, because she be no. <laughs> she legit. Like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> she's legit, yeah? yeah? So I feel like, personal-wise, I did that. Like, mm -hmm. I met a lot of different people just to have different friends just to be have different things to be inspired by to hear different stories mm -hmm. but I feel like when it came time to go to certain events or do certain things where I would just be in different rooms that I would never be in maybe mm -hmm. an opportunity wouldn't come out of it mm -hmm. but just to be in a room with a whole bunch of photographers uh -huh. or a whole bunch of like production people maybe that would be just something different for me to experience yeah. so I feel like I didn't really do well mm -hmm with that last year and I really want to do that this year. Yeah, my perspective on that is this. Yes, she's absolutely right. It's very important to start surrounding yourself in, with people in different industries. And the main reason being is that you start learning that these people do not think the same way that you do. They don't operate the same way that you do. And if you don't start making yourself familiar with that, when you do get in these situations, you're not going to know what to talk about. Mm -hmm. You're not going to know, again, how you can bring what you do to their industry. You're just not going to know how to interact with people you've never been around. Right. So it's definitely important. And, and you had mentioned that Tiffany said, um, how are you going to get other opportunities? That's the, the head right on the knee or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know the saying. But that's like the main thing right there is that sometimes we get so stuck in our industry, in our little world. I used to, when I was dancing more... I felt like I was in a bubble. Mm -hmm. I'm, re I'm realizing now that I was in a bubble and all I was thinking about was dance and dancers. Exactly. And even sometimes I find myself at dinner or at lunch with dancers and they're like, look at this video. And I'm like, is that all you want to talk that. about? Exactly. And the point that I want to make here is there's value in what you do when you can bring it to a new industry. Mm -hmm. That's when you get to a point um, where when you do say, you know what, I want this amount, they're not second guessing it because they're like, we need what you have to offer in this industry. Mm -hmm. We want to bring dance to fashion. We want to bring dance to technology. When you're in an industry where it's so oversaturated, it depreciates, exactly. the, the value goes down. You know what I mean? I so totally, that's very, totally very important. So what that. are you going to do differently this year to get yourself in those environments? Um, I mean, this year, I am making it a personal goal to, again, still meet new people. And when I'm invited to places that mm -hmm. aren't, dance related it's not enough to just be like oh i'm tired mm -hmm. it's been a long day to really push myself to really go out there and when i get to these places not just sit back and mm -hmm. chill but really network and really meet new people i feel like a big part of me is just being like this big personality mm -hmm. so i can relate to people so it's really important for me to if i if you invite me somewhere if tiffany invites me somewhere mm -hmm. even if i feel like it's not gonna help me right. just to be there yeah. and experience it and like you said to see how these people communicate mm -hmm. to see you know, just all those things. Yeah, because so. it's like, I probably, I'm probably going to say this in every episode of the Creators Club, but 99, 90% of your opportunities are going to come through your network. Yep. And I've been in plenty of situations where I'm immersed by people who do not dance, don't know anything about it. And when a dance situation comes up, a way that skill is needed, guess who they go to? Right. That one dancer that they know. A lot of us put a lot of our respect and a lot of our attention into like, I need to be around these choreographers. I need to impress these choreographers. Right. But at the end of the day, it's like, no, you need to be networking with directors. And people that are in different industries because they also need these skills, and you're, you're, you'll be better off um, being able to get the opportunity from these people than that one choreographer that everyone's trying to be friends with. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So it's like totally like network with those choreographers and be in and be in their faces and be in those environments, but you gotta branch out. Do you feel like there's ever been a moment in your career that because your network per se wasn't big enough as far as being diversified, 
that it's hindered your career in any way, or at least stopped you from getting to something that you really wanted to to do an opportunity that you really wanted. I don't think it's hindered me, but I I think I've realized how important it is to have that wider range of knowing people in the community. Um, the way that I got the Gap commercial kind of solidified that okay. for me. Um, I didn't audition for it. I didn't submit for it. Um, it was just a woman who took my class, wasn't a dancer. Mm-hmm. She was a regular woman who worked at a production company. Right. And she took my class. She took my class and she took two other people's classes. So that's all she knew as a dancer. Yeah. And she literally was like, you know, one day I was just bored, so I wanted to come and take class. I took three classes in a row. And it just so happened that that day, mm-hmm. she took my class. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And from there, that's how I got that opportunity. But I mean, maybe if I would have known her already or been in a room with people, just meeting with people who are in these type of situations, they wouldn't have to go taking class to figure to it out. To find it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that's where it showed me like there are so many people out here that we wouldn't even second guess. And because mm-hmm. she wasn't so good, maybe I may not even have paid her no mind. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. But there are so many people who are in so many high places that we don't know and we're so stuck. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. going out for drinks with dancers yeah. or going to a party where they're just dancers mm-hmm. because we feel like if I'm seen, then the dancer will know that I'm here. And... I think what I learned from that is a lot of times as dancers, we're trying to impress people who are trying to impress people. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm trying absolutely. to impress this choreographer who's trying to impress a director uh-huh. who's trying to pre- like impress an artist. No, I need to be at the top with the artist, with yeah. the production person, yes. like you said. Yes. So I think, again, not having a closed network hasn't hindered my work, but it's helped me realize that I need it to be a little bit yes, bigger. Absolutely. And I need to branch out and not just be in a certain place with certain people. Yeah. And again, and I don't even want to say that it's just necessarily like, go to events and yeah. go to this all the time. I'm talking about like at the neighborhood coffee shop. Mm-hmm. It's just being more open to like right. having conversations with people and because you really never know. I've met people on airplanes that were creative directors and were like, oh, I'm a creative director and I do commercials. I write commercials. Here's my contact. I met people in Ubers that are like, oh, my daughter is a film director. You hit her up. She's looking to film some stuff. Like, it's just being spontaneous. Right. And again, and just being a people person. Um, and, and being open to the fact that other people can bring you the opportunities that you want, not just the immediate ones in your industry that you currently know. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, so let's rewind a little bit. So let's talk Cardi B. So <laughs> she's big right now, mm-hmm. huge right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of people may not know that you created out her first music video mm-hmm. um, for Forever mm-hmm. that I'm in. <laughs> um, so what is your relationship like with her now and, and her whole team? Um, to be completely honest, I don't really have a relationship with them right now. Okay. Um, and... I'm okay with that. Um, I think, to be completely honest, because that's just the type of person I am, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people are looking at it right now. Like, Cardi's winning. Mm-hmm. She's winning. And like, what happened? And you're not like on it. And I have one question to ask, and I'm going to leave it at this. And we can keep talking about it if you want, but mm-hmm. do people know who her dancers are and can they name them by name? No. Okay. Because that's not her focus. That's not her brand. Yes. So how am I losing... By not choreographing for somebody whose brand is not dancing. Okay. That's not really helping me. Okay. Because when you look at Cardi, when you look at her videos, when you go to her performances, are you going for the dance? Not really. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's not a bad thing. It's not to say, oh, I'm not I'm not working with them now, so whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not to say that, but it's to say it was a moment in time. It was mm-hmm. amazing. I did some great things. The little bit of dancing that you did see mm-hmm. and that you remember her doing was because of me. Mm-hmm. And now moving forward, that was the situation and it's done. Mm-hmm. But to answer your whole question, I don't really have a relationship with them no more. Okay. But they see me. <laughs> I guess my question to follow up from that is, when you were working on this team, mm-hmm. do you feel like you created an opportunity for yourself to be invaluable in the situation? And when I say that, I mean, did you ever turn the scope around and say, you know what? Let's not approach this from a dancer perspective. Mm-hmm. How can I step up and be more on the creative direction side or be more of a vision and create what this girl can be and what we're seeing? Because I think a lot of the times when a choreographer or a dancer goes into a situation like that, we automatically just think, I dance, I choreograph, I throw steps at this situation. Have you ever stepped outside and said, okay, this is my opportunity with a fresh artist, a fresh platform um, that I'm putting work on. How can I be involved in what they're seeing and kind of take the dance away for a little bit. Have you ever thought, have you ever looked at it from that perspective? That was the whole reason why I got into it. Okay. I wanted to start with someone. I wanted to be able to mold someone. I wanted to be able to 
be like, yo, this is my vision. I see this. I hope that we can make this work. Mm-hmm. And for me, it wasn't me who I feel like made myself invaluable. Mm-hmm. I feel like it was the dancers. Okay. If that makes sense. I'm being like super candid about this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm totally fine with it. Um, a lot of times people just want to work. Okay. People just want to be on jobs. Mm-hmm. People just want to be in the scene. So <laughs> I'm constantly not only fighting for artistic vision, okay. but I'm fighting for integrity for dancers. Yeah. And if the people behind me aren't fighting for that, this person who is trying to like show this bigger picture isn't really needed because you have people who will do it for free. Gotcha. And you have people who will dance for free, so they don't need a vision. Mm-hmm. As long as we have these free dancers or these cheap dancers that we don't have to pay mm-hmm. for, okay. or we don't have to pay a lot for, that doesn't matter. He, he, he's not really needed that much okay. unless we need new choreography. We don't really need a vision right now. I you see. know what I'm saying? I see. So it became that situation. I always came to the table with like dope ideas and fresh things to kind of, you know, make it better. But I don't know if it was necessarily wanted okay. or needed. No, but I think that it's great that that you are looking for that type of platform to grow with. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Because I definitely think that especially now... Like, everyone does everything. As long as you put it in your little Instagram box that you do something, you do it. You do it. And I think that what's important to pay attention to now, just like everyone's paying attention to Bitcoin because it might be something, Mm -hmm. it's important to pay attention to artists that are just starting or or companies that are just starting. Latch on to those and grow with something that's just starting because in those situations, you have a better opportunity of becoming a key player Mm -hmm. and someone that's valuable to making that team operate. You see what I'm saying? So that's the point that I wanted to make with that. Um, But moving forward... um, we just, we just talked about just kind of like all the challenges and some of the stress and some of the great things that come with a career such mm-hmm. as yours. What is it that, that drives you? What is it that you, every morning you're like, I'm going to get up and do and stay committed to this because of X, Y, and Z. What is it that drives you at the end of the day? And, to, and then following that, where is it that you want the Keenan Cook's brain to go? Mm-hmm. I think what drives me every single day, and people probably don't believe that I think about this, but I wasn't supposed to be here. You weren't supposed to be where? Here, where I'm at. I wasn't supposed to be dancing. I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this. I was told that after this surgery, I would not be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I can even wake up and go and teach a class or even step my foot down is enough for me to go balls to the wall. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people don't have that awful moment Mm -hmm. to push them forward. So when I'm denied an opportunity, it doesn't matter because I still have another opportunity To do something else. And because that happened to me, I promise you, every day it makes me want to go harder. It makes me want to go so hard because I was not supposed to be here. So I don't take any of it lightly. Um, I think ultimately for me, what I want, like the biggest thing for me is I I look up to people like Jamie King, Mm -hmm. like Nappy Tabs, who have these creative, crazy visions and they're able to bring them to light as creative directors. So for me... And um, that's what I would love my overarching last, like, hoorah to be. I would Mm -hmm. love to be a creative director for award shows, for these artist tours, for these movies, for these TV shows. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like I'm gaining the experience to get there. But I think that's the the biggest thing for me that I really want to do. And a lot of people don't know this, but I like to cook. Really? I really, like, when I'm done dancing, I, I've talked to my mom about this a lot. Not really done dancing, but, like, when I'm, like, oh, I'm old, I can't dance anymore. <laughs> I want to go back to school, to the culinary art school. Really? And cook. Yeah. I feel like I heard you mention that a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny, because every time you travel, you're always like, who's making me breakfast? Yeah, because I'm who's making me food? Like, I want to try to do it. Like, but <laughs> that's, like, something that's, oh my that, that really interests me that I would like to do, too. But in terms of, like, the art, yeah. I really want to get into creative directing because like the moment that I watch something or I hear a song I see a vision Mm -hmm. like right away and it's like supernatural and I never knew that beyond like dancing that there was something there was a title for that you know what I'm saying I I never knew that really up until like a few years ago Mm -hmm. so that would definitely be like my the the big thing for the the Keenan brand yeah um how about a dream do you have a dream client is it in fashion is it in music is it in technology do you feel like you have a dream client yeah I do um my dream clients everyone knows Kelly Rowland okay um I've always been a big fan but I also feel like because I've been a big fan I feel like I know what I can do to really get her to that place that Mm -hmm. she needs to be and um I've been like working my way to get noticed by that team and I've been doing pretty well Okay. There's been some things that have been seen, but like that's a big dream for me. 
I feel like I'm always like why her? Why? I'm not. I her for me because in my career I feel like I've been the underdog, mm. and I feel like she's the underdog. Somebody who's super talented, but for some reason hasn't taken off the way that I feel like she should. Okay. Like I I feel like she can't. You don't feel like it's too late. Absolutely not. It's never too late. I was told that I wasn't going to be able That's to dance. That's right. That's right. And if you sit and listen to shit like that forever, you'll be stuck. And I hope that she don't. It ain't too late, Kelly. <laughs> and honestly, like some of your best work comes when there's a true passion connected to yeah. it. Yeah. So I love that you feel like I relate to this, yeah. to this girl. And I know that I can take it to the next level. So I'm rooting for you. I hope that that happens. And every year, it's <laughs> on my board and I get closer and closer. I'm not going to tell mm-hmm. nobody how. But um, that is like a, a, a dream artist for me. Nice. Yeah. Any tips that you can give to any aspiring, whether dancers, teachers, choreographers out there that just may be like in a place where they're like, all right, I just got to this new city. I'm a better dancer now. And just any tips for any aspiring people that want to get into this type of career? What would you what would you give them? What were the things that you wish you knew? Two or three things. Um, in terms of like just something like personal out of my mouth, I would just say don't forget why you started. I feel like a lot of people get in this industry and they're like, it's, it's all about dance. They love dance. Mm-hmm. They love choreography. They love teaching. But then the hype starts. Mm-hmm. The fame starts. And then you forget that you just did this as a kid because you loved it. Yes. Like I get on these jobs or I get in these situations and people are like, ah, I need to be paid for that. Or I need this crazy rate. And I'm like, not to say don't get what you deserve because right. we all deserve what we deserve. Right. But I'm like, I feel like some people get so caught up sometimes like, yo, I get to wake up every day and do what I love. That that's a big thing that people can't. Some people can't do that. Right. Some people are forced to work a job that they hate. Mm-hmm. So I feel like once you keep that passion alive, mm-hmm. it will make your work one authentic, and it will true keep you true to yourself, and it will keep you working hard. Um, in terms of like moving to a new city, I think it's really important one to know that talent, like you said, talent is talent. You yeah. either have it or you don't. The next focus is really like. Um, finding your niche, finding what's your thing. And once you find that, it's like networking with people and really like selling your brand and selling yourself to them and not trying to be like the next person because right. the next person's right. already taken. Yeah. The next person's already working. The next person is already where you may you might want to be. Yeah. So it's really important to just find who you are and sell that to people and not trying to be like somebody else. Speaking of, um, with social media, I've learned... It's really easy to try to portray a certain life that may necessarily be the real deal. Mm-hmm. So what's your opinion? And I wrote a piece about this, like a short little in- excerpt on Facebook not too long ago. But what's your opinion on people that spend a lot of their career trying to look like mm-hmm. they're successful and look like they're affiliated with this brand and look like this is the situation. But when you really strip it all down, they got three roommates, like, you know what I mean? Like barely being paid for jobs. What is your opinion on that type of lifestyle? <laughs> I mean, one word for me is whack. Like, it's it's whack. <laughs> and I, I think it's whack because at the end of the day, like I said earlier, you're trying to impress people who are trying to impress people. For me, like, we have to think beyond the moment. Like, we're thinking, like, what can I post within this week that's going to keep people involved? Bro, I'm thinking about, like, 20 years from now when I can't dance. Right. Like, what am I doing now that's going to get me to that point? So it's lame to make people think that, you work with this artist or you're doing all these things when you're not because ultimately it's not getting you anywhere. Right. You're, you're staying stuck in the same place just for a picture or right. a post or a video or a few likes. Yeah. To me, it's, it's lame when you can really be taking the time to focus on really being there yes. or getting beyond that or yeah. not just being in the background, being in the forefront. Right. But because social media is such a prevalent thing and I get caught in it too. Mm-hmm. We feel like we have to post. We feel like there has to be something where people are going to forget about us. Yes. If you are literally as talented as you say and you think you are, and what you have to offer is like super genuine and super new, nobody's going to forget about you. Yeah, they're you. not. They're, they're not, not. going to forget about you. Yeah, the little the metaphor that I used was I, I compared it to getting a bad record deal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's still an issue now, but it was really bad back then. Back yeah. then, where people would like, they were so sold on this idea of having fame and fortune and, and this and having their songs on the radio and, and they would sign these deals blindly not knowing what they were signing and mm-hmm. they would get in these situations and yeah, they were touring. Yeah, they had songs on top of the charts. Yeah, they were all on music videos and doing this and doing that. But when the check came in, it was for a dollar. Exactly. You, know, you know what I mean? And 
just a big problem where it's like I just did all this work and I have nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's I think that's a a problem that's getting more prevalent now with social media is this idea of like I gotta look like I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. I gotta look like I'm being booked. I gotta look, but it's like like you said, every year you're jogging in place. You're not really making progress. You're not really thinking long term. You're not really setting yourself up so that in five years from now, like nobody cares about these credits. And again, when you get out of that bubble of being you know, a dancer, mm-hmm. when you get out of that bubble and you do realize that, like, the people outside of this industry don't care at all that you've danced for Beyonce and Ciara and this person and that person. All they want to know, what the hell are you going to do for me? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Now you're going to make me money. So, good point. Any last minute words? Um, <laughs> what's up, y'all? No, I, I, I'm good. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm super yeah. proud of you for doing this. Thank and you. I mean, just thank you for allowing me to tell my story. Um, I just feel like a lot of people just assume from what they see Mm -hmm. and they don't really know the struggles that people go through every day. People don't know anything. They don't know. (laughs) They just don't know. Like they don't know like out of all the stuff that I said. So I think that this is an amazing platform to let you know that even though things look great, they're not as easy as Mm -hmm. they come or maybe they are, but that's my story. Yes. It's not yours. Exactly. So it's, cool to just have this platform to be able to do that so thank you oh thank you for coming and yeah definitely a big part of my vision with creators club is to give artists a voice to be able to say that yeah because i wish i could have watched something like what we just talked about before going out into this world and somebody would have told me like nah you can't just get here and focus on dance you need this you need that i wish i had a way to, to learn that right before because it would have cut out so much of the bullshit that i was doing Absolutely. trying to get to this point so that's the point of the Creators Club. Oh my God, so thank you. I of think course, that that was a great conversation. I really hope that it helps some viewers out there that are watching and, and want to know this information. Mm-hmm. I usually do this thing where I want to end our, our conversation with a little bit of a toast where we just kind of put some great energy and positivity to move forward. So um, today I'm going to toast to um, not being limited by constraints right. um, and st- committing to your dreams and sticking to that no matter what. Absolutely. That's my toast. And you get your own personal toast. Um, I'm just toasting to staying true to yourself uh-huh. and not getting caught up in hype. There you go. Yes. All right, let's cheers to that. Cheers. <laughs> but with that being said, thank you guys for joining us. And um, that was a great conversation. I hope you take away yes, something. Yes. Definitely make sure that you're subscribing, commenting, so that we know if what we're talking about is actually helping you. Um, all the links to stay connected with me, as well as Keenan, as well as the Creators Club will be in the uh, box below. And we'll see you guys next time. No fake social media living. (laughs) (laughs) All right, see you guys later. We are on episode eight, and I'm very, very excited because we are here with Keenan Cooks, episode eight, The Creators Club. Let's get it.